Welcome to the Spiritual Leadership Podcast with Pastor Paul Chapel, pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church and founder and president of West Coast Baptist College. Welcome back to the Spiritual Leadership Podcast. I am excited about the materials we're going to be sharing today. And before we get started, I just want to thank each and every one of you, not only for sharing the time with us, but for sharing this podcast with others, whether that's been through social media or word of mouth. It's been a blessing to hear from a lot of new friends in the last four to six weeks. Every four to six weeks, it's our desire to take some of the things we're learning here at Lancaster Baptist Church and uh, share those with friends across the country and around the world. And before we get into our lesson today on team building, I want to take just a few minutes to answer a couple of questions that have come in uh, from those of you that have been watching and listening along the way. And I hope uh, some of these answers might be a blessing to all of us as we get started today. The first question comes from a man who says, I'm currently serving in a great ministry, but struggling in my role in the ministry. And uh, do I need to be patient in this role or do I need to approach my pastor? Let me tell you, that's first of all a great question. And I've been studying recently from First uh, Peter chapter 4 on the uh, recipients of grace. Uh, at time of our salvation, God has given each of us uh, a divine enablement or spiritual gifts. These are the gifts of His grace. And every one of us has a different gift mix, different uh, niche for ministry. So let me just encourage you with this thought. First of all, you need to be developing every opportunity that God gives you to teach, to serve, to help. Secondly, you may need to be patient with your pastor as he's trying to observe what your gift is. Uh, I can think now of, of a number of men in our ministry, they're, they're just plugged in doing what God created them to do, and it's fun to watch that. I've got a few men in our ministry that are younger that right now we're watching uh, with our executive pastoral team, we're kind of watching some of these young men that are interns or new assistant pastors, and we're trying to discern how is he in that particular area? Uh, what are his spiritual gifts? And I would simply say to you that patience is a part of that process. And, and sometimes failure is a part of the process. You know, you, you realize, wow, I've got to grow in administration. That was the most disorganized you know, youth meeting we've ever had or uh, the choir practice just got way out of hand. Uh, and, and you'll make some mistakes along your journey of discovery. If you feel you're getting to a place where you are just kind of spinning your wheels, I would encourage you at some point uh, to go to your pastor and just say, Pastor, I, I just want you to know I, I love our church. I'm thrilled to serve with you. I feel like maybe I'm not really uh, hitting on all eight cylinders. And, and I just want to ask you, do you feel that my gifts are being used effectively where I'm at? Do you feel you see anything else in my life that might uh, indicate that I should be doing something else? And so uh, there is a point in time for that. And I think the point in time to go talk to the pastor is, when you feel like your spirit may be affected negatively by the process of waiting. But let me tell you as, as a senior pastor, don't assume that no one sees or no one's interested just because they're in a waiting time. And I believe God's gonna lead you and help you and uh, I'll pray that he'll open up the right door. You be patient and uh, yes, uh, trust the Lord, but then if you feel you need to talk to your pastor, I'm sure he'll be ready and willing to do just that. Next question is uh, a question about starting a new church. And I love this question. Uh, the, the pastor says, what books of the Bible or sermon series do you find most effective in starting the new church? And, uh, and especially with new Christians who have little biblical background. Well, I will tell you this, uh, I love church planners and I think it's so awesome to take a group of people who don't even know where the book of Ephesians is and begin to teach them about the eternal riches of Christ. And so I, I have found that on Sunday mornings, uh, it definitely helps to have a sermon series that is expositional, but also has a theme. So uh, you may choose a theme that deals with overcoming, and then you may uh, develop that series with messages from texts in the Bible uh, that speak about overcoming. So greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you can talk about what it means to be born again and what does it mean to receive God's spirit at the moment of salvation. Uh, Romans 9, 7, if we have not the spirit of God, we are none of his. 
there's a lot that you can do right there under the banner of overcoming, but now you're teaching about salvation, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, walking in the Spirit, etc. Uh, you may do a message that deals with Daniel in the lion's den, still on this matter of overcoming, speaking about faith and trusting in God, or Gideon showing that uh, with God, if we're obedient, we will be overcomers and we will be victorious. So for me on Sunday mornings, I like a theme because I think our people can talk about it. They can invite friends to come and hear uh, according to that theme. And uh, then uh, for me, with respect to the Sunday night services, that's where I get a little more involved. Now, you know, the fact is that in the independent Baptist churches, the, the autonomous churches that I've grown up in, Sunday night has been the big place for developing strong Christians through strong declarative preaching. And let me just put a, put a quick commercial out because I see uh, many of the mainline denominations cutting Sunday night. I think some of our independent Baptist men have looked at that. Uh, and I know we're all tired, we're all busy, the culture's changing, everything's online, on and on and on with the culture shift. God has still ordained the primacy of preaching to touch and change hearts. I love Sunday night. And so let me say this, Sunday night, preach through books of the Bible, 1 Thessalonians, the marks of a mighty church. I'm doing right now 2 Timothy on being a soldier of grace. These are great opportunities to teach uh, young Christians about the character uh, traits of, a, of an effective Christian, uh, growing in grace, walking by faith, enduring trials uh, through the grace of God. So uh, when, you, when you think about the new church, you're thinking in the Sunday morning services about being uh, expositional in your messages, but uh, uplifting and encouraging. Sunday night, again, expository messages, but, but faith building, character building, block by block, that's where we've built uh, Lancaster Baptist. So I hope that helps with that question. Finally, the question, what about church finances? Should every detail be left open for the men members on a regular basis? You know, I don't think every detail should be left open. I, I believe, and I don't believe the average member even wants that. I think our budget uh, may have a thousand lines. Uh, our deacons see the vast majority of those. We give them a little packet uh, about once a month, and uh, we review the uh, various, uh, the variances, those, those overs and unders, and kind of keep them posted. When we give the budget to the church in January, it's a higher view than that. Uh, we give a couple dozen lines perhaps, and we give an explanation about those categories. And that, that may be a category of printing and promotion. It may be a category of salaries. It may be a category of, of uh, building related. It may be a category of missions. Um, and then what we do is we just have an open door policy. And uh, we tell our folks three things. Number one, our books are audited annually by an outside auditor. We pay about $20,000 a year to have our church books audited. Number two, our financials are reviewed monthly by 35 men who kind of go through the minutia, look at, look at the variances, ask questions, and so forth. And then, number three, that they can ask a question anytime they want. I think the main issue really is to be vulnerable and transparent and open to people wanting to know. If somebody wants to know, for example, how much are we spending on you know, light bulbs, you know, I don't think the church meeting is the place to ask that. I think that's something that can be asked during the week. So uh, I believe you can give uh, your folks the budget annually, uh, give, give your leaders uh, monthly an update. Some churches, some of my friends uh, do have uh, sort of a synopsis that they'll put out once a month. I think that's fine. Uh, but I think to give all the minutia uh, probably is just uh, sometimes, uh, as one of our newer Christians said to me, he said, uh, I attended a church for a while before I was saved, and uh, they always were talking about the budgets and the business, and it was distracting to me. And uh, I think sometimes churches get distracted in the minutia, and they, they forget the main thing, which is preaching the Word of God. So I hope some of those thoughts are helpful to you. And let's go on to our lesson for today. We've been talking about team building. And, uh, you know, I believe that as a leader, one of the great privileges I have is to bring people together for ministry and to uh, teach and challenge them along the way. And then as they develop spiritually, to see them formulate into teams. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about uh, what kind of leaders are interested in team building. And we said, first of all, spiritual leaders. A spiritual leader is someone who's walking in the spirit. He's, he's sensitive to the fact that God is raising other men up. 
He's coalescing them into teams for effectiveness purposes. And uh, spiritual leaders are men who have a heart to teach others also. And then we said last time that uh, strategic leaders uh, are building teams constantly. Uh, strategic leaders in the church today are developing teams for the purpose of Sunday school and education and teams for the purpose of youth and uh, college uh, groups and teams for uh, the daily operations of the church, such as finance and such as uh, counseling and all of the different facets of a growing church. There are many different teams that need to be developed and the pastor must be thinking strategically with respect to uh, meeting the needs of the church, just as he did in Acts chapter 6, as the church did. They saw the need for ministering to the widows, and they strategically developed a plan for meeting those needs. And of course, that always involves godly people getting involved in ministry, and it's always fun to see it work well. Well, today I want to speak to you about this subject, equipping leaders build teams. An equipping leader is someone who sees his responsibility not only to teach the great truths of the Bible, but to teach them in such a way that the church can then use those truths in ministry. So we are equipping the saints for something, right? We're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So as we think about that, Ephesians 4, 12, and 13, as we're doing this work of equipping, uh, equipping leaders are going to constantly be building teams, uh, and, and you're going to be developing people around the common goal of getting the gospel out. So I'm gonna share with you today some of the ways that I've tried to build the teams that I work with. And fundamentally, as we think about the context of this, uh, I work with a team that we call our pastoral staff. Uh, there's 14 men on that team. Seven of them are ministry leaders that deal with bus ministry, children's ministry, uh, they deal with uh, various aspects of the ministry here. And seven of those men are on an executive uh, leadership team that actually helped me uh, carving out matters of vision and implementation of the program and so forth. And uh, all 14 of us are committed to uh, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. But my basic commitment to them uh, is to provide an atmosphere and a culture that's conducive toward their development so that they can help with developing the teams all throughout the local church. Uh, 70 ushers, 240 nursery workers, um, you know, 150 junior and primary workers, and, and uh, 20 or 30 parking lot workers, and all of these different teams. Uh, I wanna set the culture and the vision so that our ministry leaders and, and our pastoral staff can help with leading each of these groups. How do we develop those teams? Let me share a few thoughts with you this morning. First of all, you want to develop and equip them with a biblical philosophy. All right, that's so important uh, personally for me. 2 Timothy 3.14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Can I, can I just tell you something briefly about leadership development? Um, I believe that we can learn from just about any organization, whether good or bad. Um, I've read dozens and dozens of books on spiritual leadership, uh, secular books, Good to Great, The Advantage, all these different types of books. One of the things that concerns me, and I don't, I don't listen to tons of podcasts, I, I don't uh, have time to attend a lot of conferences uh, uh, as, as much, but, but I do sense as I, as I hear tidbits from social media, as I've seen a few either podcasts or uh, listen to certain leadership tapes, it's concerning to me uh, that many of those that are Christian in genre are really not biblically based. I mean, I've heard a few where not one verse was given. And I know that might sound critical, and I, I may be uh, giving an alarm that some of you have already heard. I really believe as we go off track sometimes for leadership development, meaning by that, uh, outside of the things that we have been taught biblically, that we need to do that very carefully, very discerningly, and probably not to the majority. I can often tell just by observing uh, a pastor's ministry, if he's spending the majority of his time in the Bible, the majority of his time in biblically-based philosophy, or if he's going more and more offline just for the, uh, just for the content that sometimes is derived from a uh, totally secular mindset. 
Now, in some cases, a secular mindset on parking, hey, if Disneyland does a good job with parking flow, go learn from Disneyland. But we don't want to learn all of our growth principles from those that merely market. We want to be biblically based in what we're talking about so that every purpose of the church comes back to the scripture, right? Why are we doing what we do? Because the Bible admonishes us to do it in this way. I really believe that's so important. We're gonna lose a generation of preachers and Christians if we don't always come back to the Bible. So how do we try to accomplish that with our teams here at Lancaster Baptist? Well, uh, one of the things that we, we try to do is, uh, first of all, encourage our leaders uh, at a spiritual level, whether that is in devotions uh, at each of our leadership meetings, just taking some time for devotions and prayer, whether that's with group reading. Sometimes we'll read a book, uh, two or three a year, that deal with biblical principles of, of uh, leadership, organization, clarity, and so forth. Uh, sometimes we'll have some of our team go to a seminar, go to a, a conference at another good Bible preaching church, and, and they'll bring back some things that they have learned. But the team must be constantly developing with biblical mindset. Uh, also, I believe it's important to have weekly training. Uh, our Friday afternoon staff meeting, it's informative uh, because we're talking about calendar and what's coming up next. It's collaborative because we're bringing together church, school, college, publications, etc. But it's also a time of development together with biblical philosophy. So we're always teaching lessons. We're always uh, involving uh, our staff in teaching or hearing uh, how that we might grow together in a biblical philosophy of soul winning, discipling, uh, problem solving, dealing with parents, whatever the, the topic of that lesson is. I also am a great believer in annual retreats. Uh, we take an annual all staff retreat every August where we really come back to the basics. We come back to the basic of soul winning, come back to the basic of, of servant leadership. And uh, those have been very helpful for us. In addition to that, uh, some of our uh, team leaders will take their team on a retreat once or twice a year. Uh, our executive pastor, Gabe Rule, he may take the ministry leader somewhere for just a time of fellowship and training. Uh, he or I may take our satellite uh, uh, pastors for a time of training. Some of these satellite pastors will eventually take the satellites into a church plant. And we really view this as a, as a great training time for them. Some of them will be a part of our uh, ministry uh, as, as an extended staff member uh, for many years to come. But in any event, we want to train them and we want to have a similarity of philosophy of ministry with anything that's attached. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a deviation. Sometimes uh, there's uh, uh, a, a Sunday school teacher right here on campus or even at a satellite, and we've got to kind of corral that back in. And believe me, uh, when there is a deviation, somebody in the social media world may bring that to my attention before we see it. But rest assured, friend, we're dealing with those things all the time. Why? Because we always want to bring everything back to a biblical philosophy. And sometimes the way we do that is with these team meetings along the way. Uh, another thing that has helped us is to have guest speakers come and speak to the church and then have them stay over and speak to the, to the staff. Uh, maybe they're going to speak on a Monday, Tuesday. I'll ask them, hey, would you take Tuesday and just talk to our staff about biblical philosophy of ministry? Always working together. Uh, we've done some secular training in the realm of time management. I don't have a problem in the world with bringing someone in to talk about how to be more organized but all, always coming back to the biblical principles, redeeming the time because the days are evil, etc. cetera. So uh, we want to equip with a biblical philosophy. Let me say secondly, uh, you want to equip your team with joy and enthusiasm. Uh, sometimes I have failed in this area. Sometimes I, I can become so weary that I'm not exuding just constant energetic joy. Um, I think the best person to remind me of that is probably my wife. And when she is, I normally need to take some rest. I, I sometimes what I've learned is if it's Friday and I am way behind for Sunday or I've had a really bad week of counseling, whatever, I'll have one of our men who's had less pressure that week to do the staff training on Friday. And uh, these are just little lessons you learn about yourself. But you need to always remember people are not attracted to organizations. They're attracted to the leaders of the organization. And we've got to have a right spirit in this training so that we keep things involving the culture of our ministry uh, on a positive way. Uh, I've often found that in training folks, 
one of the greatest keys is when you see them doing something well to let them know that. Uh, the best way to help someone reach their fullest potential is to catch them doing something right. And that's something we want to recognize in our meetings, uh, someone that's done well, someone that's had a victory, uh, that's been a blessing. Uh, and then let me say thirdly, we want to be equipping, not only with a biblical philosophy, not only with biblical enthusiasm, but also with a mindset for delegation and succession. You know, I've read different studies, but they say a leader should be giving away about 10% a year of what he does. There should be a delegation of, of about 10% of your work and, and involving others in the ministry. And I, I really believe as we're training, we're also looking for ways to share more and more of the ministry with the team that's coming in. Uh, it has been said that uh, we only permanently succeed when we're developing others around us. And, and we're, we're a church that must be committed to discipling and training and developing others around us. And so uh, in everything you do, be thinking of, of succession down the road, but in the intermediate time, delegation along the way. Uh, it's interesting to note that in every church, there will be people that will move. There are times when staff will move along, perhaps uh, to take the pastorate. I read this quote, I believe, from Peter Drucker. I thought this was interesting about staff transition. He said, inevitably other organizations recognize your quality of employees and will try to hire them. However, if no other organization is impressed enough with your staff to want to hire them, it may be an indictment of either your hiring or your training process. It ought to be a matter of great satisfaction for you to lead people who would be desired by another organization. You know, the fact is that sometimes people move. Now, I love our, our staff, I hate it when that happens. But, but when a church would want someone from our staff, it's a compliment to the culture and the training environment here. A lot of times I'll see uh, different ministries that because they're not having training, because the pastor doesn't uh, discipline himself to train, they're always trying to get people from other ministries to come to their ministry. And there's a, there's a place for that, and we've hired from other ministries as well. But fundamentally, what this lesson is about is it's about being a team leader that's raising up your own team. Let me give you this illustration before we close. We decided a few years ago that we would seek accreditation with a Christian accrediting body for West Coast Baptist College. It is not government uh, oversight. It is not uh, what I thought uh, for many years. It's truly our mission going forward, working with a Christian body uh, that helps us stay on mission and, uh, and encourages us to have a master's degree teacher in every classroom and a person with a doctorate at the head of each department. Well, we could have gone about that in two ways. We could have gone outside of our ministry and just started hiring somebody simply because they had a PhD. But I was not willing to give up or abandon the DNA of this ministry in order to become accredited. In other words, I wanted people that were soul winners, that loved the local church, that were Baptists, people that were uh, going to be faithful to the Word of God. And so we decided to develop from within. And right now we have uh, seven men that are closing in on their doctoral work and finishing that up. And we've been working with them on accountability and soul winning. And when they're in a real crunch time, writing a thesis or whatever, and they need a few weeks off, that we bring them right back in and that we're just maintaining the spirit and the accountability all along the way. It's so important that we continually develop. And yes, one of the reasons is because sometimes people do move, sometimes people need a break. We wanna have a deep bench all along the way. Ultimately, pastors must remember, every pastor is an interim pastor. When you get around age 50, you start thinking, you know, I've gotta have two or three guys around here that, that I'm training and watching and Maybe one day they're going to take more and more of a preaching role and maybe 10 years from now or so, one of these guys might even be the pastor here. And we just always want to be training Timothys along the way. And so I want to encourage you with a biblical philosophy uh, and also with joy and enthusiasm and with a mindset for delegation and succession to be training that next generation. Finally, let me encourage you to do it with modeling and mentoring. Philippians 4.9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Remember that phrase, and seen in me do. And we must mentor from a platform of respect. 
that platform will be a platform of character, not credentials. So uh, it's not enough to have a college education, but we must, in a one-on-one -on -one way, be modeling and mentoring the next generation as we go. And so spiritual leaders are going to build teams, and strategic leaders are going to build teams. And today we've learned that an equipping leader is always building teams, always developing uh, for the next generation leaders that will be faithful. I pray that God will use something from this time today to be a blessing in your life as you develop the teams around you that are needed to reach your city with the gospel. We trust you enjoyed this episode of Spiritual Leadership Podcast. If there's a question or topic you would like Pastor Chapel to address in future episodes, send an email to qa at lancasterbaptist.org.